Five TV. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this special live stream with a uh, fantastic guest here, Gigi Fernandez. And if you can see all of us right now, please uh, type in the chat that we are actually live. That would be helpful. Um, I'm actually going to click over uh, to YouTube right now to double check. But Gigi, how are you doing today? Good. I'm, uh, I've been looking forward to this 530 meeting for a couple of days now. So <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it, I hope that everybody has checked out, or at least many of you, uh, Gigi's uh, part one on uh, analyzing the volley videos submitted by you, the players, which has just been really cool. I know that when we selected uh, the very first five, which I think within like either the first five or 10 minutes, Gigi, from when I emailed my email list asking, you know, who would like to volunteer, it was already we had like 20 people and it was crazy. So, oh, uh, yeah, yeah there were sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we, we can do more. Um, I think those are comp, but um, but I do offer them, and I they're fifty percent discount right now because of what's going on. But we can talk about that later. Let's let's get let's um let's analyze some volleys. Yeah, for sure, for sure, and uh, appreciate that. And we'll definitely talk about that. But uh, I just want to say hi to some peeps over here. Uh, we got Bill Hughes from England. Hello. Uh, we've got uh, Bor Masha. We've got Tate Kareem. Don, Lynn, I'm just going to put some of you on the screen here real quick. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. We have a, a great turnout so far. Oh, I see Nanette. And Nanette's a friend. Hi, Nanette. <laughs> Nanette Kiernan. Awesome. Yeah, thank you all for coming. So um, uh, I guess I'll ask you a couple of intro questions, Gigi. Sure. Uh, first off, which uh, uh, so first question for you, what, what are some of the, just like the low-hanging fruit in terms of like the biggest mistakes that you see volleyers making that if they actually practice that particular aspect that they would really actually help their volleys a lot? Um, the, the most obvious one that comes to mind is, is split stepping. Uh, I think players uh, don't split step at the lower levels. And, you know, split stepping is as simple as playing hopscotch in, your, in the yard. You know, if you remember when you were a kid and you would hop on two legs and hop on one leg, hop on two legs. Um, that's just what a, what a split step is, is uh, hopping on two, on two, on your, both of your legs at the same time. So, um, so that's a really easy one. And then also the timing on the split step, you want to make sure that you time this on, um, let me talk about where you split first too. So you want to split on the balls of your feet. A lot of times people will split, but then they're on the heels of their feet. So they're leaning back and you want to be splitting and be, and be leaning forward. And the reason that you split is because it's easier to move a moving object than an object at rest. So mm -hmm. if you ever try to push a car uh, from standing, it was it's really difficult to move the car. But once you get the car rolling, it's a lot easier to continue to push it. The same thing with our bodies. When you're standing still, you know, in a kind of ready position, and there's no movement for you to take that mass and move it, uh, it takes a lot of energy. But if you're already splitting, when you're splitting, you're already moving. So when you split, it's easier. Uh, to then go one way or the other. So you want to make sure that you're splitting with your with your feet um, or on the balls of your feet, and then you're almost lean, falling forward when you uh, are in the ready position. So when you split, you're already almost falling forward. And then um, as you see the ball coming, then you decide if it's going to the right or the left, and then you go towards that ball. Now, the the split, the, uh, the progression on the split or the progression on a volleyer going from 3 to 3-5 to 4 4 5 you know, and then to a pro is um, a lot of it is indicative by how much they split, right? Because 3 3-5s three don't split generally. They just kind of take a step across. The players, when they start getting better, they start splitting, and then you split and then take the step across, split, take the step across. And then with the high-level volleys, it's actually a three-step uh three step split so you split and then you pivot your outside foot or you step out on your outside foot and then you step across with a forehand volley and then i don't know if this is showing on the left or the right i'm mirroring myself here but <laughs> you split outside step and then and then go across so um if you think of dancing when you're volleying uh it would really help you and you know more more is better like you can never over split you can never split too much so uh, if you want to improve your volleys, like one simple thing to start doing right away is splitting more. Even if you're a 5-0, you can split more. You can start splitting with three steps. And it's very tiring when you split, when you do a three-step uh, split routine. But um, 
that's what you have to do. And then the other reason that we do, I'm kind of getting in the weeds here, but the other reason that you do a three-step split routine for the higher levels is because you have more reach. So if you think of you splitting and then stepping and extending with your arm, you're only going to get to however far you get. But if you split, then you go with our outside foot, then you do your foot and then your reach, then you're going to almost be able to cover um, the entire court, actually, or the entire half of the court of a singles court. So so it gives you a longer longer reach when you do the three-step volley routine. Love it, Gigi. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot more movement than people actually think uh, going on, uh, you know, especially in doubles, actually. I was talking with Ian Westerman from Essential Tennis a couple of days ago, and he had mentioned how, you know, a lot of players, they forget to move, uh, you know, uh, up and back too, as well. Like sometimes we're just going laterally. Uh, and, and so that was a great point I heard, but I, I want to ask you a fun question before we get into, yeah, uh, let, let me just, let me yeah. just say a point to that. First of all, I love Ian. He's great. I love all the stuff that he does. Um, the, I think people get in trouble because they try to create power by generating the power with their arms or like swinging at the ball. And what he's talking about, I think is you move through the volley. So as your body moves into it or or through the ball or pass the ball towards the net, that's how you get power. It's your body moving through the volley um, and not your arm or your uh, wrist or your uh, elbow moving. It's just really like your arm is really, really straight and your body uh, kind of moves through it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, Gigi. And, um, you know, I think uh, now let's maybe go into the videos. And so I'm just going to take a, a few seconds to, to try to screen share. But I just want to mention the individuals that we're going to uh, whose volleys we're going to check out today, which are uh, Sabina, Kristen, and I believe it was Tim. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, nope, sorry. Irving. Irving. Yeah. So really excited to show these off here. So I'm just going to go to little screen share here and uh, work on my technology skills and I think we'll be okay. Um, so let's go to, all right, we have Irving's volleys here now. So I hope you can all see that. Are you guys all able to see that or Gigi? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. So let me just, before you start that, when I analyze someone's volley, I'm gonna take the 10 steps uh, to a perfect volley program that I, or steps, right? So I'm gonna look at the grip, the ready position, the split step. I'm gonna analyze the turn, the backswing, his posture, um, the hit, what's happening at the hit, the swing and the, and the follow through, and then finally the recovery step. So normally when, um, when you're trying to do this yourself, you should pick, you should, you know, first of all, learn what is, what is the correct way to hit a volley, right? And then pick one or two things that you think are wrong and then try to work those on those one at a time. So as I watch these volleys, which I've, this one I have not seen, um, I'll kind of see what stands out and I'll share it with everybody. Cool. And so right. with, with this, we're going to uh, try to play it. And then, you know, in case it doesn't run super well, I'm just going to kind of drag the, you know, the play button or whatever that is. Um, and, and we'll be good. So let's try to go through it and just let me know if it looks okay. 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 So um, immediately what I'm seeing on the, on the split step is the first thing I'm seeing. Um, you can pause it right there real quick. Sure. Um, his grip does not appear to be continental, but it's kind of hard to see from this angle. I'm pretty sure that unless he has a two-handed back and volley, he's going to have to change his grip. Um, the ready position is a little bit upright. If you go back to the ready position, he's kind of standing a little bit back on his heels. I like that ready position to be a little bit closer in. And then he's doing this funny thing with, um, can you move that? Yeah, thank you. He's sure. doing, watch his left foot because he's, when the volley comes, he's taking the left foot and moving it to the left, which is kind of strange. Uh, let's see that. So sp split, and then he takes a step kind of out of the way. Like he's, mm. you see how he's like stepping, you're stepping, uh, what's it, what, uh, is this Philip? Oh no, it's Irving, I believe. Irvin, Irvin. So Irvin, you're taking your, left foot and stepping stepping it out of the way as opposed to stepping into the court maybe the balls are coming into your body but if the balls are coming into your body you actually want to take your right foot and step it behind so then you're turning because this way when you step to the side like that there's no shoulder turn so what i'm seeing is um let's see a pivoting of the hips then when you're when he's moving the left foot to the left then his hips are pivoting so it's creating like a kind of awkward turn um, let me watch the backswing now. Continue. Mm -hmm. 
Too far back, you think? Yeah, it looks too far back. It's not a good angle, but it looks like it's too far back. And also, he's le you're he's you're leading with your wrist. Normally, you want to lead with the racket, so so your your wrist has kind of laid back. You can see when he takes the racket back, he break you break the wrist. And the bashing on the on the turn or the bashing on the volley is just you know when you have your well formed V, so you have the ready position, the arms in front. If those are w well formed, you just have to turn the V without breaking your wrist. So I see um, his wrist breaking. Uh, and then on the follow through, let's see, the follow through looks pretty good, even though I don't I don't like the grip because I think it's a little bit eastern. Um, and like I said, he's going to have to change it when he goes to the back end. But he has a pretty good follow through. Uh, it just, he doesn't seem to be crossing the planes. So I look at two mm -hmm. planes, the horizontal plane, and the vertical plane. If they do you see how the racket is finishing above the wrist uh, or above his waist, which is actually pretty mm -hmm. good or kind of waist level. It's not dropping the wrist down, which is another very common error that we see with players. And also he's not coming across his body on the volley. Um, mm -hmm. And then finally, let's look at, is there any kind of recovery step here? Let's see that recovery. Yeah. Yeah, kind of, sort of, but but yeah. it's weird because he's like, I don't know, because uh, he's stepping left out of out of the way, and I would have preferred if he was actually stepping to the volley as opposed to stepping away from the volley. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you're stepping away from the volley, you can't really step into it because your body momentum, his momentum's going towards the left fence or to the, towards the fence over his backhand side as opposed to coming forward into the net. Mm -hmm. So oh. that's what I see on that one. There we go. We can actually have a mode where we uh, we're a little bit on the screen. I don't know what you prefer, <laughs> but uh, uh, that one's fine. Yeah, either one. Okay, cool. So let's um, see. Do we have a side view on him? A side? Oh, of the video. Um, yeah, I just have that one. Uh, like here? No, I mean like you're, when I had the the recording. Was oh, it front view, a side view. Yeah. Let me see if we can uh, get that going here. We have a second file. Um, let me just take a moment to, oh yeah, this is a side view. Fantastic. So let me just reshare. Yeah. You can see a lot on the, a lot of different things on the side view. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Uh, I believe this is it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, uh, ready position looks pretty good from this angle, but here you can again, see that steps, the same volleys from the side position. We can see the backswing. Uh, can you pause the backswing at the end? Uh, yeah. Let me try to. Yeah, grab the little thing, little. Ah, oh yeah, I'll grab. This. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so if you pause it there, so you, yeah, a little bit more. One more. Yeah, there. Stop. So you can see how his racket is behind his wrist here, right? So he's kind of leading with the hand, and yeah. Um, normally you don't want that. Normally you want the either a worst case scenario where you parallel because you want to hit on the outside of the ball, right? So when you when your racket is in front of you. It's very hard to hit on the outside of the ball unless you come through and slap. Mm. Can people see me now? Because I'm pulling my racket out. Can, can yeah. You, can I'll, you see us I now? Can, okay. can you oh, you want to be seen. No, it's actually better if you can see, <laughs> I think. Yeah, because then we, when we demonstrate things, it might be easier. Yeah, so there. So that's a good example of the racket being too far back. Um, it's pretty good shoulder turn. Um, I would like – I prefer the left hand to be a little bit more – it seems like it's overturned, mm. the left hand. Do you see that? Mm, it could yeah. be not, not so turned. Um, and then let's see it keep playing in slow motion. Okay, I'll just drag it then. Oop. Oh, yeah, let me make it. Let's let me talk about the point of contact. Go back to point of contact there. Yeah, so that's actually not bad. It's a, it's a pretty good point of contact. Like, norm, they sometimes people make the mistake of hitting the, vo the volley actually too far in front, particularly on the uh, on the backhand side, is a problem with the forehand volley. When I think about the forehand volley. Your your hold the arm that you're holding the racket with is behind you, right? Because you know his left arm is in front and his right arm is behind. Um, so with the forehand volley, you actually have to think of hitting the ball in front of you. Otherwise, if you hit it, you know if you hit it parallel to you, then you're going to be hitting it kind of on your hip, and it's too late. But on the backhand volley, people have a tendency. We'll see if he does this when we get to the backhand volley. In the backhand volley, people have a tendency of hitting it too far in front. So when you get up here, this is a really weak position. Uh, if you str if you have somebody push pull your arm down from here and then have somebody pull your arm down from here, this is a way stronger position. You're you're holding with stronger muscles than you are here. So you really want to hit the the back and volley by your side. So like right here 
and not here. Um, so, uh, so that's okay. It's a, a little, maybe if I'm going to overpick it, it's a little bit too far in front, but, but that's just being kind of over picky. Um, so, and then the bat and his follow through was good. He, he didn't break the plane. Let me, let's continue with the follow through. On this. Sure. Sorry. I'm like doing triple duty with the comments. And <laughs> that, oh, that's okay. No, no worries. Uh, follow through. Racket state. Man, I see a racket drop. You see the racket head dropping there? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So you couldn't see that on the side view. You can see it on this view how his racket head has dropped uh, at point of contact where you always want to maintain the V. There's a V formed with your arm and the racket. I don't know if you can see me, but there's a V formed. Let's see. Where am I going? There's a V formed here. Here. That's the backhand volley. And there's a V formed here. So you want to maintain that V throughout the stroke. Like the racket head should never drop <laughs> below the rack, below um, your wrist, which is what happened in this case. Uh, so does he, do we have his back in volley? Yeah, let me just load it up real quick. We'll, uh, we'll just play this for you all while I'm loading it. Um, but we will, oh, I guess it's gone. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see, back in volley number one. And, and then we'll after, I see all these questions coming in. After we finish analyzing him, we can take a minute and answer questions and then go on to the next one. Yeah. Um, or Because it's kind of hard to... Yeah, it is exactly. I, I typed that in the chat too. I think it's a 400 backhand. That should be the 400. This should be the back. Oh, it's a backhand. It is? Yeah. Oh, well, he's, that's on the wrong side. Yeah, so normally, let's just fast forward this one because normally okay. the backhand, you should shoot, he should have shot the backhand from the other side mm. so you can kind of see his body. I mean, you can kind of see here that the same issue, he's playing off a ball machine and the ball's coming right to him. So he's having the same issue of getting out of the way. Yeah. So his momentum on every, you can keep playing it, but his momentum is going to the left uh, every time he hits the ball, it's supposed to be forward. And he's going, um, his racket is dropping below the level of the of the net. So he's hitting high to low, which it, let's see the side view. I think we might be able to see sure. it on the side view. Um, and while I transition, Gigi, when you're practicing with a ball machine, like is there any sort of um, ways to like make it more realistic or, you know, better practice or like like where you should practice from? Like, well, just... so what, what he was doing, he, he was positioning his body so that the ball was coming right at him and then he had to get out of the way. What you should do is, you know, position the machine so the ball is, to start out, position the machine so it comes to you, but stand like maybe at two feet or three feet, two feet, or something comfortably. So like when you step across into the ball, uh, you're hitting the volley. Once you get good, the best way to practice with the ball machine is to alternate. So forehand volley, backhand volley, forehand volley, backhand volley. Mm. But um, but having the ball come straight to you, I think we're going to see this same problem again where he's getting out of the way of the ball. So, okay, let's see the side view. So again, I, I see here he's on his heels. Uh, he's not not a very good ready position. Little split. Let me see if he splits. Can you move the bar? Yeah, there you go. Split. Oh. The other way so I can see his feet. Sorry. Here we go. Oh, that's okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, so split. All right. So I'll play it again. So pause right? when I go play it as slow. Play in slow motion. Oh Step yeah. Let me just drag the uh, the line. Yeah. Yep. All right. Here we go. So bad. Oh, yeah, nice and slow here. <laughs> good there, turn, good turn, good backswing. And then he comes high to low. And you see where the yeah. how it's dropped below the level of the net. Um yeah. and also his grip, uh his grip is a little not quite continental. Like um let me can you can you show can you show me real quick? Um sure. so I want to explain something because a couple of people have asked me about this. I talk about cocking the wrist on the back and volley. Mm -hmm. um and when you when you on the back and volley you want to cock the wrist twice so the first mm -hmm. cock of the wrist is this way so that's okay. one let me get over here so th so you cock it this way show you and that. then the second and the second one is this way so you're here once and then you're here twice and then that's what's going to get you on the outside of the ball like if you watch federer federer really over exaggerates he's the master at this i mean he's almost like supinated like a 90 degrees here 45 degrees when he mm. hits the ball so um, so people get in trouble when they do this right mm. and that's what we're seeing with him he has this kind of grip um and, he, and his wrist is not cocked um so again we, if you don't have continental this is hard to do sometimes people will go to a west uh, more of a western grip or like a forehand western grip and think that they've cocked 
but really you have to be a continental and then uh, do the cocking of the wrist. Um, so you can get on the outside of the ball, which is really the key to great volleys is yeah. hitting on the outside of the ball. And, and Gigi, sorry, could you once more just show us the first position and then the second one? Just super quick. Yeah, so yeah. let me see if I can do it. I'm going to do it this way. Okay, uh -huh. so so here's here's um, to find continental, you make a V with your finger and your um, forefinger, right, with these two, and then you slide it down, and then you hold the racket, just hold the racket with your two fingers. These are the two fingers that give you um, – control right so with these two fingers you can almost volley right you don't need you, the hand is there to hold but this is the volley happens from these two fingers right so once you're here you you place your hand around it and you have this kind of spread out finger um grip a lot of times people grip it uh i call this a hammer grip where your hands fully together and you don't have a lot of feel when you when you volley like this like i said the feel is going to come from these two fingers um, and then the cocking, the cocking of the wrist happens. So this is, I'm cocked already, but when I grab that, I'm already cocked. That's once and then twice. So that little move there is what's going to help you hit on the outside of your back and volley. Um, Sweet. hope that makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, so you, yeah, so you can see if you pause, pause him at right contact. Contact. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oof. Right, you can, or yeah, so you can see after contact, he drops his wrist, right? So, and and that point of contact for me, that point of contact is too far in front. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I was saying, like, he, he's almost 12 inches or 18 inches in front. I mean, it's pretty far in front, like, you, you really want to be level with your body on the back end volley. Like and so, it, with, with the finish, Gigi, sorry if I interrupted you, but like. Where what's ideal and does it vary depending on you know like what what height you're hitting the ball? Yeah, so there's three really three positions you can hit the volley from, right? You can hit I call um let's call high volleys position three, mid level volleys position two, and then low volleys position one. And then if you want to go back to me, I can explain this. Um, yeah, sure. Without having the guy there. Um, so if you have three volley positions, we have a high volley. We have a waist level volley and then we have the low volleys, right? So all three of those are going to end in position two. So if you have a high volley, you want to come three to two, right? So you want to come down a little bit to get that ball on the court, but not three to one, which is a very common mistake. If you're if the ball is waist level or net level, then the swing path is fully parallel to the ground, right? You don't come up and you don't go down. And then if the ball is below the level of the net, so in position one, you have to come up from one to two. Because you need um, you need that depth you need, by coming up from one to two. You first of all you clear the net, but you also give the ball the depth that it needs to get hopefully deep on the court. Because as we know in doubles or in singles, if your volleys are short, you're going to get creamed, right? So so going from one to two on the low balls gets you the depth that you need. Awesome, Gigi. Very good stuff. So let's see. Did you want to look at another video? Yeah, let's let's do one. Let's do another one. I think we have three to do, right? Yes, we do. So, do we have any questions? Um, that oh, yeah, we, we can look at questions right now. Uh, feel uh, free to look now. at some Gigi and answer while I get these videos up here. So Joe's asking if you take the balls that come to your body as a back end, and the answer is yes. It's much if the ball's coming to you, you're better off hitting the ball with a back end volley than you are um, having to get out of the way. To hit a forehand volley actually if you want to um i'll go back to you yeah yeah come back to me real quick so that was a good question so if the ball's coming to you ball's coming to you get out of the way hit a backhand volley as opposed to having to step out of the way to hit the forehand volley so any ball that's coming uh right at you should definitely be taking uh with a backhand volley sweet all right let me go back. okay so jeff hagan has a good has oh. a question about proper core precision for volleys he said he asked four pros and he got six opinions. And then he asked <laughs> if we can address it. What was the question? I always like these when like what, I like to what, sorry, where was it? Or who? Um it was Jeff. Where did it go? Jeff Hagen said, Good question, Steve Gersham, about proper core procedures for rallies. I asked four pros and I get six opinions. So Steve Gersham, you should um where is Steve? Sometime. Gonna find him. I don't know if you can search by person. <laughs> Yeah, shoot. I don't think I can, but I'm I want to find mm. it. I can highlight it. Oh, was this the question? Where should you initially set up? Where should you what one 
where should one you initially set up on their on your approach? I'm not. I don't understand the question. But so if we're talking about court positioning for doubles in general, you want to be standing somewhere in the middle of the service box. That's a very general. I mean, I, I have this thing where I break the box in half, break it in back in half again. And you draw like a six foot circle. You stretch your arm and draw a circle around yourself, about a six foot circle, and that's where you should be when you volley. But in reality, you don't get there right away, right? When you're coming to the net in doubles, you're always going to have to hit a transition volley. I'm not always, but 99% of the time, or maybe, okay, let's say 85% of the time when you're coming to the net, you are having to hit a transition volley, which is a volley sometime, somewhere between the service line and the baseline, right? It's very hard to get from the service line all the way into half, you know, halfway up the service line inside, inside the service box, unless you get a really slow ball. That's, the ball travels normally faster than, than you do. Um, but yeah, so I don't know if that answered the question, but. Cool. Um, so yeah, he asked it again. Where, where should you set up initially in your approach? Yeah. I think so that wasn't the answer. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Sorry guys. Uh, We're uh, <laughs> so many comments, but really appreciate all of them. So, uh, cool. Well, let's go to this video from Sabina. Okay, wait, wait. Somebody first, asked, uh, can you demonstrate the back and preparation position on the racket racket hit by the ear? Uh, no racket hit by the ear. Ear? Trying to hit your ear in the, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's a good visual. So, so preparation on the volleys, um, so we're in the here. Let me stand up. Hold on. Get the balls here. I should have worn my tennis outfit. All right. So <laughs> you're in the ready position. And I actually have a video I could share with you guys. Um, you're in the ready position, forehand volley, right? And I watch how I just turn my V, and that's that's the ready position. And then back and volley. So from there to there. That's the extent of my back and volley. And then from there I go forward. Um, usually less less is better with the volleys. <laughs> No question about that. Most recreational players over swing their volleys and over hit their volleys. Got All it. Right, let's go to the next next analysis. All right, next analysis, and we'll come back. Um, so here we go. I believe I have it up here. Oops, nope, it's gone. No. Uh, yes. All right. So let me maximize this so that we can check it out. Okay. Awesome. So all right. Oh, oh yeah, I've seen this one. I think. Yeah. All right. All right. So this is four zero. I think she was a four five actually. A pretty good player. Yeah. yeah. So you can see now we have pretty good split, um, and she actually is starting to work on her outside split. So let, can you go back on that last volley? I want to show this what I was talking about. Um, okay. So his pretty good uh, racket, pretty good ready position. Feet are you know balances in the balls of the feet. There's a good step split step going on. And then I want, I'm like trying to focus on the right foot right there, that little move. So I think when you go back, we lose the, so her feet, she, she has a three-step volley sequence that I'm talking about. So she splits, then her outside foot moves and then her um, inside foot uh, steps across. The hands could be a little bit further away from her body. If I'm going to super pick it apart, like it's a little bit too close. The back swing's a little bit too long, like, um, I would prefer if you can. Oh, you can now we in slow motion on this. Yeah, I got slow, slow motion. motion. Yeah, that's good. Um, it's, so you can see a like, good split step, outside foot, and but the, the back swing's a little bit long, and then mm. kind of a little bit elongated. Like she's trying to get power from her arm movement as opposed to her body um, shifting through forward. And it's a little bit of shifting forward. But I, I still think that the swing is a little bit too long. This is a pretty good volley. What do you see, Marvan? Yeah, I think it's pretty good too. I think you know the first thing I noticed was the backswing. So you yeah, know, obviously, a long. and then yeah, she kind of slaps a little bit there. It's a little yeah. sloppy. She's not quite a, quite getting on the outside of the ball. Yeah, so especially with like hard hit uh, ground strokes, you might have some trouble with that. But yeah, I mean, otherwise pretty good. It doesn't go too yeah. low um, either. The the uh, follow through, so that's good. Yeah. 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 Pretty good. Uh, let's see. You want me to bring another one up or do you want to keep looking? I think we have our back end. Do we have our back end? Yeah, we do. Let me give me up. Oh, uh, might want to turn that off. <laughs> Let me put it back on Gigi for a second. Oh, if you can, if you have any questions you want to answer, feel free in it while I get this one. Yeah. I was actually looking for, uh, let's see if I can find it. 
Oh, did you uh, want the forehand volley front view, or did you want to just go to a backhand? No, actually, let's go to a backhand because her her front view kind of showed almost the same thing. Okay, would you prefer backhand side or backhand front? Uh, let's do side or front first. Front, okay, front. Yeah, we'll do that. Let me just uh, figure this all out here. It's technology, fun times. Okay, we're almost there. Oh, nope. you know, if you if you want, I have a quick demo or a quick video of me hitting some volleys. Oh yeah, I, can you I share on your screen? Yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, yeah, sure. share my screen. Uh, share screen. Share. Optimal positioning. Oh, um, I'm gonna share this one. There's a lot of good questions on here. Okay. So now I don't know what you see. Oh, I see. Oh, I just. Oh, oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. So here, let's do this. Let me make this big. Oh, All right. So we just kind of run through. <laughs> so here we can see like good foot. I mean, I'm gonna analyze my own volley. I I, I can pick <laughs> this apart. Like I came too far around on that one, but you can see how I really follow to my target on all these, um, and how my body's moving through. This takes about an, a minute and a half, so we'll just kind of go through it yeah. and see in slow motion. Wow, what a different a good split, outside step, inside step. Split, nice turn. That was a little bit further away, but with that extra foot, I, I'm able to. And then also watch the that one. I was lazy on that one, <laughs> uh, but always recover. Always recover to the same spot. Um, so other people watch high ball, and I still don't come down. Right, so that was a little bit higher, but it's still finished. Yeah. Uh, and I think I have a low one somewhere here, but maybe not. All right, so that's four hands. We can watch the back end. My hair was getting in the way. So, uh, yeah, these are okay. I, don't know. I wasn't so happy with these. I was not quite on the outside of the ball. Um, you know, I'm not as strong as I used to be, so I kind of depend on um, different things now. Let's see. Not bad. So, I, so a little bit scoopy on it, right? It was a low. And my, I feel like I'm dropping my racket hit if I'm going to pick it apart, but still pretty good. I think it's all right. It's yeah. not bad. Better than uh, ninety-nine percent of us, you know. <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted people to have a visual. Like that's why when I analyze, I'm analyzing against this. Which you know, it's funny. Like I, I say, if you watch Roger or Martina or Pete Tempras, like um, people who've had like like classic volleys, most great volleyers, um, most volleyers, and I'm gonna stop sharing. But sure. most great volleyers in the history of tennis have hit the volleys the same way. You know, there's hundreds of ways to hit forehands and backhands, but if you look at them in slow motion, there's some that we all have the same similarities, racket hit both wrist, the turn, the point of contact, hitting outside the ball, kind of like knifing it for, if, if you want to call it that. Um, so there's some, definitely some commonalities that, that must have, must be in place in order to have a volley that's going to hold up uh, under pressure. And the, the more you can approximate, your body to what I just showed, the more that your volley is going to uh, hold up under pressure. Yeah. Uh, real, real quick. Uh, what's a good uh, trick? I mean, is this just, a, you know, having the proper continental grip with the, uh, you know, for, to keep the wrist? I mean, that, that's a start, but it's also your body, like being, like being really um, in control of your body and your balance. There's a lot of balance when you're hitting volleys. You know, I used to volley, I used to put a, a towel on my head, um, mm like just fold up towel, you know, arm put on top of your head and then try to volley uh, a regular rally with a pro hitting um, without dropping the towel. That's a really good drill, a uh, really good way to practice because if you have exaggerated movements or you're jerky or you're, you know, get, uh, dipping from the waist, which is a real common problem. A lot of sometimes people dip from the waist as opposed to um, getting down with their feet, then the, the towel is going to fall off. Uh, so practicing with a towel in your head is a, it's a pretty good way to practice volleys. I like it. So many. What did you just put up? Is, did you have, we just had oh, a question. I, of the, I had the L, the, the wrist locked in L position. In L position. No yeah. matter how my wrist keeps breaking from. Well, first of all, are you incontinental? And you know, if you don't have the starter right grip trainer that um, was selling with the on, with ten steps to better volley, you can buy it from Encore Off Court. It's this little device. Let me see if I have. Uh, I can hear what they know. Yeah, it's just this little device, right? And that, when you put your hand on there, will keep you on continental through the whole stroke. Like I cannot 
even if I try to change the stroke mm. um, or change the grip rather, it doesn't allow me to um, to change it. So, um, you know, we, we need these props. Uh, I had something like that when I was playing, <laughs> when I was, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, I used to put a piece of tape um, so I could feel where my, if my hand was moving, uh, I didn't have something like that because they hadn't invented it, but I wish they had. Um, so yeah, you need, you need ex external uh, stimulus when you're trying to change something because you don't, sometimes you don't feel it. Uh, you don't know if you're not doing it. Yeah. Maybe super quick. If you don't mind this, this is a pretty good question. You know, if you get a dipper at you, which is what I love to hit against my net opponents, uh, what's the optimal uh, shot for you? What do you usually do? Gigi? Oh, I just hit, I just drop it. Are they at the net or at the baseline? Uh, so if yes, you're at the net. net, if you're at the net and then you're facing a dipper, oh. But where are they? Are they at the baseline or are they at the net? When you say you they, you mean the person hitting? The, the opponent hitting to me, yeah. Okay, so the opponent, let's say the opponent is me. Well, we're playing each other, and then you rush the net, and then I am able to hit a dipper. I just drop like, it back. Just okay. drop shot. <laughs> with <laughs> the noise. <laughs> yeah, with the noise. Just take the pace off and... Um, and you know, always you always want to hit uh, angle shot or, or drop shots in doubles or um, even in singles. Like if you're volleying drop shots, they should always be cross court. Because if you hit the volleys down the line, they are going towards the person. So if you don't execute it perfectly, they're gonna get it. But if you volley across court, even if you're not great, the ball is moving away from the opponent. So make sure you don't hit drop volleys down the line in doubles specifically, okay. but also in singles. In singles, you would do it if, if it's coming off a cross court ball. So the ball is coming from cross court and then you can drop it down the line because that's a longer distance to travel for the opponent. Got it. Got it. Okay. I promise after this question, I will move to the video. But so Vivek, who, uh, you know, I've faced many times, a very good player. Also, shout out to Victor, uh, Anthony, and everybody on the Facebook chat. Um, but um, Vivek asks, what do you do with a high backhand volley coming at full pace? With a high forehand, say it again. Sorry, a high, and this is on the Facebook chat, so I don't think you can see it. But what do okay. you do with a high backhand volley um, at full pace? So you say I, I blast the ball at your, and you're at the net, and you you have to hit a backhand volley. What, so, what do you do? You just have to hold your racket. Like really, when once you get above your shoulder on the backhand volley, unless you have two hands, you're not going to generate. If you have two hands, you can generate power with this one. But once you get up here with a backhand volley. You're just holding, like you're like you know, like I'm saying, less is more with the volley. Sometimes you don't even have to swing. If the ball's going really hard and it's high, you just hold, you just get your racket in the in the way of the of the path of the ball and let the their ball do the work. So you just hold it there and it's going to go back. Um, you know, you if you have great racket hit awareness, wherever. Let me tell you, give you a little secret. Wherever the strings are pointing is where the rack the ball is going to go. <laughs> Right, so <laughs> if you have really good racket hit awareness, you will know um, where to point that racket hit. You know, and it's, uh, this comes with you know practice, millions, millions and millions and millions of balls. The more you practice, the more racket hit awareness you have, um, because there's, there's no mystery to it. Like I said, wherever the ball, wherever the strings are pointing at contact, that's where your ball is going to end up. So, um, so try to gain that racket hit awareness as you. Uh, as you get better. And then Bill Hughes here was asking, why is there such an emphasis on learning the continental grip when it feels to me like the natural forehand grip? Um, the reason we want continental is because you don't want to change, at, at a certain level, you don't want to start changing your grip from the forehand to the backhand every time the volley comes because at the net, you don't have enough time. Um, and this is universal, right? I mean, at three L three fives, probably can get away with it because the ball's not coming so hard. But once the ball starts coming harder, your ability to change grips effectively um, is diminished. So, if to get to the net, to that level, I mean, I, I don't know very many four oh four fives, five oh's that um, have bad grips on their volleys. And if they could be four fives and five oh's, but they're not certainly not certain volleyers, or, or they're not um, <laughs> coming in all the time, right? So, right. They might be five oh singles players. I mean, let me just say that I had a, I had a client um, who was a four five, very good player. And she, her grip was panhandle, right? Wow. She had this grip. <laughs> she hit her volley like this. And I tried to, I tried for a while to get her to change. You know, the problem with this grip is like you cannot hit low volleys. Like it's very difficult to get down and hit those low volleys. The only person that I that I know could do that was Kathy Jordan back in the in the late 80s. 
she had that grip. But um, you know, if you can hit like this, then you can have that <laughs> weapon grip. But otherwise, you know, you're constantly changing and changing grips is not easy, right? I mean, even on the return, I mean, I cannot tell you how many hours, thousands, tens of thousands of hours I spend practicing the the just standing there returning, practicing the grip change to the forehand. So I, I, I return when I return, I had back in grip, I held back in and I would just stand there with the back in grip and have my coach surf to the forehand. And I would just like do that quick. If I do that in slow motion, right. I'm back in the right position back in. And then I go and just that move, <laughs> I, I practice hours and hours. So you don't want to have to um, change your grip at the net if you don't have to, because it just introduces another another way to miss if you don't get the perfect grip. Gotcha. Cool, Gigi. Well, we will break from the questions for a bit and then go to the video here um, of Sabina. Yes. Uh, right. Is it the right view that you wanted? Yeah, let's go. We'll watch this one. Excellent. Let me make sure we're on slow-mo. I think that's probably better. Or did you want it to go normal first or just slow-mo? Um, let's go normal first. Okay, sure. And then, and then we'll slow it down. Here we go. Yeah. A pretty good split step, pretty yeah. good turn. She's stepping in. I think from the, I think on her, if I recall, I think I might have seen this one. Her point of contact was really far in front. Mm -hmm. um, do you have the side view? Uh, the side view. Yeah, I should have that. Let me just bring okay. that up real quick. Um, let me put it back to you just so I don't divulge my <sighs> inbox secrets here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, for floating, okay, so Gerald, while you do that, Gerald asked for floating shots, where does power come from on the volley? So the power on the volley comes from your body momentum through moving through the ball. And also, vo volleys are not about power. Like if you're hitting swinging volleys, like ground strokes in the air, you, that's where you want power. But if you're normally the volley is a placement shot, like I much rather have a three quarter pace, well-placed volley that lands, you know, two feet from, from the baseline than a powerful hard hit forehand volley that lands uh, two feet from the service line, right? Because it's much harder for somebody to attack a ball that's two feet from the baseline than it is two feet from the service line. So it's it's not always necessary to put power on the ball if you have good placement. Yeah, great stuff, Gigi, as usual. Oops, oh man, I removed it again. Uh, let's see, oh, okay, yeah, perfect. Okay, I think we got it now and we can do the side view. So I'll run it for you all. All right, here we go, split. Yeah, let's go in slow motion on this. Split. Okay, let me do the slow mo. Oop, that's not it. Dang it. All right. Um, here we go. Let's see. Split, turn. Not bad. She comes down on it. And then also, can you pause it at, at the back point? Because her racket's pointing straight up. I think I did this one. Her racket was pointing. What's her racket point to the sky on the back turn? Okay. Let's see if we can scratch that. There, good. But that her racket's pointing up. Mm -hmm. Was my racket pointing up? I wonder. Let me see this real quick. Yeah. So I. So. Do you want me to switch back to you, Gigi? No, no, it's fine. Oh, okay. Um, keep playing. All right. Yeah. Good. And point of contact's good. Actually, it's right in front of her. It's not too far in front. So this is a pretty good volley. Uh, let's see. Good split step. Good posture, good ready position. The okay. right, the right, the hands in the ready position are too close to her body. Okay. So, so then she, um, she's not turning the V. She's just like her arms are. Then she's kind of pivoting, uh, pivoting her hips. Let's see, split. Maybe a little bit too long of a back swing. I don't know, but it looks pretty good. And do you think the racket is sufficiently cocked as well? Like when she takes it back? Well, she does this funny thing at, at contact, which I'm trying to see it, but it's a little bit blurry, but she does okay. like, her, yeah. And then she drops. And comes and back comes up. Back up. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with this folly. I mean, I could probably, let me see one more time. 
pretty solid. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's pretty solid for a recreational player. <laughs> yeah, a better one, better you know, kind of simple. Again, the the less is more with volleys. You want to just kind of keep it simple. Yeah, for sure. So I'm gonna put it back on you. Oh, whoops. Oh, we had back. one more. Did we had one more to an LA? Uh, one more video. Um, yeah, I believe so. Um, let me just put it on you. Why do you do that? Somebody was asking how tight to hold the racket at contact. Um, the analogy I use is you want to hold the racket like you're holding a bird. So if you squeeze the bird, you kill it. And if you don't squeeze hard enough, the bird's going to fly away. So it's kind of moderate pressure, um, tight enough for, you know, you, you don't really want, you don't want like the death grab. Like you can see that muscle pouring out. Like you don't want that. You want a relaxed arm. Um, Less is more. Keep, I'm gonna keep That's saying right. that. That's right. So let's see. So I think we have um, Kristen. So we can go to hers. I think okay. this beforehand. Oh, let me just make it big. Okay. Uh, yeah, that is okay. Yeah, Kristen, I believe had a really extreme in front point of contact. Yeah, and she also leads with her hand. You can see it from there. Yeah. You can see that her her right her um, wrist is laid back if you go in slow motion. Yeah, let me put it on slow mo for you all. And she kind of comes down with her shoulder. Oh, that's the. Do you want the forehand again? Yeah, yeah. I think she has all four in a row. So yeah, it seems like it. Whoops. One more time. And this was a four five, I believe. I think so. I might have to look it back at no, that. I'm, yeah, four plus four five. She's pretty good too. Yeah. Let's see. Nice high racket. You can get a dip of the wrist, a little bit of eye contact, but a good split. The recovery step could have been a little bit more more quick. Like you always, especially at the higher levels, you got to get back to the recovery, back to your ready position. But see how she's kind of leading with her. She kind of leads with her shoulder. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if you see that. Yeah. So, so the turn is not happening for so much. Watch her right shoulder. Um, the turn. Mm. It's a good turn. Actually, it's not bad. You could, from the front view, you could kind of tell that she was um, kind of leading with her. So, so when you're when you're turning with a unit turn, um, like what you, should you be thinking in terms of like what what should lead, what should drive the unit what, turn? Yeah, those are pretty good turns. Um, what what my thought when I was turning was to turn and go towards the ball, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to turn, which is what a lot of people do. They turn, right? You want, you want to kind of turn and go to it. And that's how you get um, hitting the ball earlier. Because, you know, people think, you know, when, when I'm saying that you don't want to reach, right? But if you turn and go to the ball, you're already up. And the reason that people have to reach with their arm is because they turn and then they have to go up. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to just turning and you're already up and then you follow through. So the difference between turning and then going up as opposed to if you turn and then you have to go up, right? So so it's really, it, it's this turn that if you set it up there, um, you're probably gonna hit, hit a, uh, a good volley. So short backswing and uh, really pronounced short backswing. Well, We'll set it up good. It's sort of like in golf, right? If you have a good setup, I don't know how many of you play golf, but if you have a good setup when you play golf, um, then you're going to have a, a good swing. If you have a bad setup, you're going to have a bad swing because you return to the spot. So same with the volleys. If you have a good setup, then you just have to go to it. I suppose to, you know, if you have a bad setup, then you kind of have to invent it as you go or create it as you go. Yeah. Great stuff here. So um, you want to go to another video of uh, Kristen's? Or no, actually, you know what? Let's look at the back end on the same video if that works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Whoops. Okay. Let, it, let me get this up here. Oh, so yeah. Molly Brinkham is oh. asking. Molly Brinkham has been watching the volley challenge amongst pros hitting against walls. Is that a good drill for volleys? Um, good drill to develop arm strength. Um, and also to develop short back swings. So, I mean, it's not really how you hit a volley. Uh, I would prefer if you were closer to maybe two feet, let's see, uh, maybe six feet from the wall, like two steps, two places from the wall. That's probably more realistic 
gives you more time to put a, a full full stroke on it. But it is that is good to um, create arm strength. I actually tried it. <laughs> I was like, because I wanted to, I was going to do it with my eyes closed, but that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, my arms got really tired, so I never recorded it. But I'll probably do it at some point. Nice. Cool. Well, yeah. I've got this video here queued up now, and uh, let me put it on for you to check out uh, Kristen's backhand volley. Okay. Hmm. Quite high to low there, right? Yeah, and she's kind of getting out of the way. She's kind of sliding out of the way of the ball. Let's see, split. Uh -huh. No outside step. Yeah, she could do a better job of having the outside. Um, can it, stepping on with the outside foot and then stepping in mm -hmm. and then on that low ball she didn't bring the racket up so she actually opened her racket head to get it get it to clear the net as opposed to coming up uh with it let's see this one mm. yeah they, she's actually stops at the hit so this is a very common mistake that people make that they think they have to hit the ball on the volley like you don't hit the volley like mm. you think of you know you hit the serve you hit the ground stroke um, the volley. What the the thought that I have is that I'm going to put a, put a nice comp, you know nice compact swing through the path of the ball, and somewhere in that path, the ball is going to intercept my racket. So I'm not purposely trying to hit the ball at a certain point. I'm just kind of swinging, and somewhere in that swing, I connect it with the ball. So if I if my racket is facing my target for a long like my racket is facing the target there 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 there, there and then not there anymore. So if I hit the ball anywhere in here, the ball is going to go to my target, right? What happens with people is they they hit, right? So as you're hitting, if you don't time your hit perfectly, then you have no control over the ball, and it's going to go wherever it, it wants to go. Nice. Ooh, th I, I like this one, and I actually get this quite a bit, this question, which is how do you overcome fear of the ball getting hit? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, Just, you know, practice makes perfect. Yeah, um, I yeah. coached a couple of players who got hit. Actually, one one girl got hit in the eye. And, um, you know, it's very hard to overcome this fear other than getting out there and, and practicing. You know, a way that I like to practice volley, reflex volleys, like with four players at the net or two players at the net, it could be you and your and your partner. But it's, it's really a good drill with four where you're constantly hitting the ball back or you reflex the ball back and forth to each other, but you cannot hit a winner. So if the ball is high, you try to hit it a little bit harder at the at your opponent, but down at their feet, hopefully not at their face. Um, and then they're trying to work on their reflexes. So really the only way to lose the fear of the ball is to see it sooner. And um, what I would say to uh, Jerry also is I would, want to make sure that your eyes are corrected to uh 2020 and that you're not wearing mono uh, mono vision glasses because um you know when i got older and i needed to wear have contact lenses i have my whole life and then when i when i turned older and i couldn't read i put a um a reader like i well, had one on my eye to read and the other one to play tennis or the other one to see from the distance and then the first time i went to play tennis with the mono reader on I could not play. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was teaching a 5-0, uh, I was doing a lesson with 5-0s and I was hitting and it was like, oh my God, I was like, I, I hadn't, so I, you know, I asked my doctor and he's like, oh no, you can't because you lose death perception. Mm. So, so anybody out there, if you have, uh, you need to have a different set of contacts um, when you're playing and make sure your, your vision's corrected so you can kind of pick up that ball uh, sooner. Something so simple as that, but if you don't have good eyes, then you don't see the ball. And um, if you don't see the ball, then you're going to be afraid of the ball at the net. Exactly. I'm just trying to see if there's any more. I think that actually might be all of the videos that we have. Yeah, that's good. We've almost had an hour. And, you know, one yeah. thing that I the, – the other thing, um, to intentionally practice seeing the ball. You know, because I don't think you – know, we're always telling our players, you got to watch the ball, you got to watch the ball. But are you actually intentionally trying to watch the ball? And by that I mean – Look at the ball on the other side of the court. You know, professional players are very bad at this. They get very focused on themselves, and they don't really see on the other side. Uh, you know, starting at four, five, five, zero, oh, that you start to, but the three, oh, three, fives, like really watch your opponent hit the ball and really track the ball as it leaves their strings. 
you know, I used to try to find the Penn sign or the Wilson sign. So as the ball was coming, we, you know, the Wilsons used to be numbered. I don't know if they still are, but they used to be numbered one, two, three, four. So my coach would feed me a ball. And as it was coming, I would have to say if I saw one, two or three and a four. So when you have that kind of attention on the ball where you can actually see the number on the ball, that's truly watching the ball. It's not, um, you know, I, I think that most people don't understand what it means to truly watch the ball and see it leave the strengths and track it all the way uh, as it comes to you. If you have that kind of awareness of the ball, you should not be getting hit because you definitely have enough time to get out of the way. Most people do anyways, from, yeah. if it's hit from the baseline, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to give a little bit of love to the Facebook uh, crowd as well. And we've got one from uh, David Jackson, who actually, he is the father of uh, one of my former teammates at uh, UMBC College Tennis. But uh, David says, Gigi, you were always good at this. And I always focus on this. Keep face close to the racket at impact on volley, short and compact bunch. Focus on angle of the ball, not so much the power. Do you glean on any points there that you like? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, even though I could power my volleys, I mean, I obviously had the ability to boom, power my volleys. Um, the only time that I really powered a volley was on a high sitter that I was trying to put away, right? Most of the time, most of the volleys that you'll hit in doubles particularly or even in singles are placement volleys like you're trying to you're trying to put the volley in a place where your opponent is going to have the least chance of kind of driving a winner past past you right so placement again is more important than than power um so and that was for me you know i was a, a bit of a finesse player um and you know, nowadays I probably on tour, I don't know if it will work anymore or not because everybody just hits the bejesus out of the ball now. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. Like uh, I was just always trying to have a perfect follow through. You know, I was really always focused on having the perfect follow through because I felt like if I had the perfect follow through, the ball was going to hit my target. Like if I came off it or if I, you know, try to maneuver it, then I would, if I got too handsy with it, then um, I was going to be a little more inconsistent. Gotcha, Gigi. Just uh, creating some stuff here. So um, let's see about some other one. Any comments that you see? Otherwise, I can pick one. Yeah. Um, is a certain volley a lost start in today's game? Um, I think it is, unfortunately, because um, you know when I at the end of my career, late '90s, there was the, there was already power, a lot of it. Um, you know, Celis hit the ball really hard and. Um, Lindsay Davenport hit the ball as hard as the girls do now. And, and I played actually two years while uh, Venus was still playing. Um, so there's plenty of power, but what, what's happening now is power and spin. Like now everybody dips the ball. So, you know, Lindsay hit the ball pretty flat. So I was still hitting waist level volleys a lot of times, maybe knee, knee level volleys, but now with the spin and the power, you could be four feet from the net and you're hitting a volley from below, from your shoe tops. And if you're volleying from you know, your shoe tops and you're four feet from the net, the only thing you can do is pop that ball up. You're going to hit it. You know, you have to hit it up. So it clears the net. Um, so the, the, you know, the balance has, has totally swayed towards the baseliners. Um, and because the, uh, they hit the ball so hard when you serve and volley, I mean, you can still do it in doubles because you obviously, because you only cover half the court, but in singles, when you have to cover the whole court, it's just nearly impossible. You know, I, I used to really struggle against Monica Sellis because she stood three feet inside the baseline to return. So when I served and volleyed, I would take two steps and the return was already coming back because she was so far in. So the same thing's happening now. The returns are so big that when the girls hit a serve, if they were to serve and volley, um, unless they hit a you know, 110 mile an hour almost winter serve, uh, then the, it's coming back that much quicker. So unfortunately, I think it's a, it's a lost start for, for the pros, but we still all can uh, at our levels with the ball that are you know, the pace of the ball that we have is still possible to volley. So I have a selfish question for you. I'm, I'm curious, Gigi, uh, and you have some great instructional content at uh, ggfernandeztennis.com. I'll just put that up mm -hmm. there. But do you, uh, I know you have your own method, uh, Gigi method of teaching doubles. Do you ever, when you see a player and you see their attributes and you see, oh, well, actually they, they have great uh, ground strokes. Um, do, you, do you ever teach them to actually... Uh, stay back in, in in some situations or even the majority. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I, what I, what I coach is there's three in doubles, there's three formations, two up, two back, one up, one up, one back. Right. And you and your opponents are always in one of these three formations. And, and then we talk about who has the advantage in any given formation and you always want to play the percentages and doubles. So we know from statistics that if you're two up against one up, one back on the other side, the two up will win the majority of the points. Um, the one back, you know, when there's only one person in the baseline, they're in real trouble. And, um, you know, I like to, I like to use statistics. So it's not, I'm not making this up. Um, in the 2015 Australian open of all the doubles points that were played in the whole tournament, 60% of the points ended in an error. Right. And of the 40% points that were winners, the best ground strokes in the entire world of these 40% points that were winners, they only won 3% of the points. Okay, so this is the best ground strokes in the world win 3% of the points from the baseline. So if you are thinking that you're going to stay in the baseline and win points, you're not. <laughs> right. So the mentality of those players is either how do I set up my partner to finish the point for me at the net, which happened 37% of the time. Or how do I draw the error from the opponent, which will happen 60% of the time? So, so that's two up against one up, one back. You know you're in a good position. So what can the one up, one back do? They either – what the other one comes up, and then we're two up, two up, and that, now no one really has the advantage. Or they go back. If we're two up, two back, who has the advantage when we're two up, two back? Up. Oh. Not necessarily, yeah. right? In the recreational game, mm. sometimes the baseliners are have better volleys than the volleyers, right? And there's, you know, yeah. if you're playing at Roland Garros, red clay, you know, I, how many grand slams have been won by two Spaniards hitting, you know, baseline, hitting, playing doubles from the baseline and, and winning, you know, winning the French Open staying back. So if the surface is really slow, the, the baseliners sometimes have the advantage over the net players. But what we do know that two up against one up, one back, the two up are going to win. But if you go two up, two back, it kind of depends, right? So I absolutely encourage people to get back to the baseline if they're not effective coming in. Um, so that's your long answer. Good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. Oh, there was a great question about. Oh, here we go. Uh, what about inside out volleys? Are you still trying to? Oh, yeah, I saw that. Well? Yes. Yep. So inside out volleys are really tricky the, because the tendency on the back end volley when you want to hit inside out is to open the racket hit. But really what you want to do is you want to overturn your shoulders. So if I were going to hit an inside out volley, if I was getting, if I was not being lazy, right? If I want, if I'm lazy, I'm just going to do that. I have great hands. I get away with it and I'm going to make it, you know, 95% of the time. But when I was playing, I really wanted to get even more of a, of a shoulder turn so that I'm still getting on the outside of the ball. Um, and, and over exaggerating my shoulder turn. Um, same with the forehand volley. Like if you, if you let your racket, if you let your hand lead the racket, which is what you have to do to hit an in, in, uh, inside out volley, you're going to spray it. It's going to spray the, the majority of the time. It's a little bit, a little bit, you can get away with it more on the back and volley, like inside of back and volley, you can get away with it more, um, leading with the hand that you can with the forehand volley. But I still prefer an extreme shoulder turn and still getting on the outside of the ball on that volley. Again, for normal players, like if you're trying to hit sights, you have you have you know amazing hands, Roger. Like I could obviously do this as well. I, I on purposely would hit outside of the ball so the ball would spin away from my opponent. But now we're talking about very high level where you can slice the ball, uh, spin the ball, you know, put backspin on it, make it come and you know make, make you can hit it, make it come back to you. So we're getting very advanced. But for for most people to keep it simple and not miss i still prefer if you get on the outside of the ball very cool and i just want to do a real quick plug um if anybody hasn't signed up for uh the tennis summit tennis summit 2020 uh then i highly encourage you to check it out because then you can watch all the videos for the entire summit for free for a limited time so they're all up for 48 hours from when they go up for example you know today's videos will stay up till thursday um and then uh, if you want to have lifetime access to all the videos then you can go to, uh, actually, this should be upgrade, so I'll remake that. But um, you can go to tennisfilesummit.com slash GG upgrade, and uh, then you can get the all-access fast, lifetime uh, access to all the videos, plus uh, all the bonuses. Like, we have transcriptions this year, which is new, which is really cool, and also, of course, MP3 files and uh, implementation guide and everything. Um, but, uh, GG, what is one of the biggest things that you've learned uh, during your career that that was really impactful, whether that was from a coach or 
from a fellow player in terms of really improving your doubles game? Um, I think, you know, I had a coach once, her name was Julie Anthony, and she wanted me to play what I call it boring doubles, boring vanilla doubles. Like, um, you know, first serve, first volley, return and come in, uh, hit your high percent shot 95% of the time. You know, the difference between the great players and the good players, a lot of times it's just their ability to continue to hit the high percent shot under pressure. And it's, it's not, it's the discipline to not try the low percentage shot. And, you know, every time a ball came, I had six, five or six choices. And I knew that the first one was highest percentage one. And the sixth one would, if I made it, the crowd would go nuts. Right. So between the legs, you know, sliders, like dippers, like, you know, ex extreme angle drop shots, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's just really the um, ability to continue to hit that high percentage shot time and time again, that makes great doubles players. You know, it's not, uh, you know, you can practice all the cute stuff uh, in practice and then keep the uh, match play to um, your kind of basic, do basic doubles. I wish Curious would listen to this because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've never seen somebody try so many low percentage shots in my life. Like if he could just play basic tennis, he would be so much better. But yeah, for sure. Gigi, I'm just trying to scan to see if uh, any other, questions there were a lot of questions that you know unfortunately they just streamed in while we were doing the analysis here um yeah. trying to think i mean there was one about what are your tips on dry volley mm -hmm. can you remind me if we cover that do you remember um hitting uh hitting ground stroke volleys i used to i used to hit him all the time um you have to hit a thousand of them you have to go out of fed balls and hit balls in the air um, my, my recommendation, if you're going to hit dry volleys is that you hit him waist um i'm sorry shoulder level or above so anything that gets up here, you can drive, but anything that gets over, you know, waist level or below, you don't want to drive because then you have to clear the net um, and the margin for error is very low. Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan, but they, they have their, their moment. You know, a lot of times, like sometimes I would return and come in and if my opponent was also serving and volleying and they floated the ball, I said, if the ball, their volley was floated, then I could take that one and, and try to hit a winner winner off it but you know they're low, low percentage so you have to practice practice hitting that a lot uh to get consistent at it very cool very cool and uh oh i i shouldn't have taken that Mozart. That okay kathy from boise yeah see you in september oh yeah what's Where that about? going what happened in september you have a camp or something <laughs> oh, she's coming i think she's coming to the tracy austin camp so i had a camp with tracy austin and a camp with martina navratilova Not both in april and both had what got postponed. Um, I am coming to Boise. I think, well, I don't know, you know, this is a weird world we're living in. So I yeah. can't predict what's going to happen, but, uh, sure. but one thing I did want to say that, um, my shameless plug here, I, I have the 10 steps to a perfect volley program that closed yesterday, but I told around that we would open it for 24 hours for anybody who wanted to buy it. And, and this is probably going to, I'm probably going to regret this, but I'm going to include a volley analysis for anybody who buys it. That's a seventy, a hundred and fifty dollar value that um, I'm offering fifty percent, which it's going for seventy five. But if anybody that's listening to this buys um, the the uh, full bundle, ten steps to a better volley program, I will do a volley analysis like I just did for um, for the students here. Very cool. And that's back on uh, my website gfrancetennis.com and you can yeah you can look at on their online classroom it's actually gfrancetennis.com backslash on court off court and on court off court is the partner in this program and what's really cool about it, it's like that it comes with six different training aids so i think i showed you um this star right grip trainer this is a sweet spot trainer which teaches you how to hit the ball in the center of the strings there's a couple other ones that keep you from dropping your your uh, wrist down and another one that keeps you from Doing is that right, two, by the way? Yeah, yep. Okay. From doing, shortening your backswing. So, you know, you need this feedback when you're trying to change something because you're probably not, if you're trying to change something, if you don't have someone watching you, you probably are not doing what you think you're doing. It's very hard. Isn't it, everyone, to like feel yourself change something? You either have to put it on video yes. and watch yourself or you have to have someone, a, a pro or a coach, telling you. It's very difficult. 
Yeah, it's super difficult, Gigi. Um, yeah. Just got to really stay committed and consistent, schedule out your practices and stick to them no matter what, no matter yeah. any directions. And uh, yeah, um, just Gigi, let me know whenever you have to take off. Um, I, I was going to see if maybe you wanted to answer this one, which is... Okay, what do you do when you throw the different player percentage? For instance, they shift the wrong way and they're not receptive to changing. <laughs> Find a new partner, Andrew. Find another partner. <laughs> there you go. Last stream um, over. <laughs> and you know what I tell players? Like, when they, you know, I get this a lot. Like I, I'm following the G method, but my partner's, my opponent, my partner is not because they don't know how to play doubles and they were taught to stand in the alley, blah, blah, blah. So what I tell people is, it's better to have one person playing good doubles and two people playing bad doubles, right? So at least you're covering a, a portion of the court the right way, even if you're not covering the, the full court the right way. Okay, awesome. And what I mean by right or wrong is, high percentage versus low percentage. Like you always in doubles want to cover the high percentage shot and you want to make your opponents hit the low percentage shot. So you leave the low percentage job open and try to bait them into trying the low percentage shot. Yeah. Awesome. Sweet. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, let's see. Falling. Oh yeah. This one was a pretty good one. Um, is volleying harder than it looks? My technique is nowhere near where I want it to be. Um, does it look easy? I don't know. I don't think it looks easy. <laughs> Do you think it looks easy? <laughs> no. I, was just, I mean, I, I guess easy in the sense that you're not like, it's not like you're not using your whole body. You don't have these huge swings. Uh, it's a really controlled shot. You know, it's a really controlled um, discipline shot. Like you have to have a lot of body control and a lot of, they're very small movements that, um, it's very hard to, you know, when this ball is being blasted at you, it's very hard to be kind of calmly turn your shoulders. Like the tendency when the ball is being hit hard is to like back, lean back. Um, I like to use the skiing analogy. I don't know if anybody skis, but when you ski, you always lean into the mountain. Um, and when you're volleying, the harder the ball is being hit, the more you have to lean into the shot to kind of absorb, uh, absorb the pace of the ball. Thanks, Gigi. All right, two more questions because I got to go feed my kids. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't want them to starve. Somebody <laughs> asked right. to you in the background, but that's Nadal, right? That's Nadal. I, I forgot <laughs> to switch. Like, I have my court. I usually, I usually put this in the back. Yeah, oh, that's nice. My court, but yeah, I forgot. Yeah. So that is Nadal. I bought, I, I won that at an auction. Like, Oh, I know, okay. I thought you were just a ago. huge Nadal fangirl. That's <laughs> no, actually, I love I love them both. I love Rafa and I love Roger. Um, yeah, I'm they're my two way. favorites, yeah. Yeah. So, so you don't always be struck with a firm cog laid back wrist or other students are allowed to go from Congress. No, I, I think you cog. The problem is if you don't, again, it's um it's you're introducing a, a move that if it's not if it doesn't time perfectly and it doesn't happen at the right time, you're gonna miss the volley. Right. So if you're if you're what I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're you're asking me if it's okay to do this at some point, right? Um to neutral wrist position before hitting the volley. So, I mean, you would drop the wrist if the ball got below the level of the net, but but once you're cocked, if you can keep that, you know, when I, if you go back to my full vision, um, when I hit my volley, non, nothing is moving other than my shoulder joint. Like my elbow is stiff, my wrist is stiff, and my shoulder is what where the move is coming from. There's none of this and none of this right? It's all from the shoulder joint. Mm -hmm. So I always think of your volley from the shoulder, um, you put a swing there, and then hopefully you intercept the ball in the right spot. There you go. Last one, Gigi. I've okay. had partners that want to poach on almost every shot. Wow. Oh. How do you convince them not to when they're not receptive? Um, well, if they're winning points, it's okay. But if they're not winning points, um, I would maybe ask them to give you a signal, to do signals so that you know they're poaching and you can kind of cover behind them because if somebody poaches on almost every shot, they're going to get burned on their line quite a bit. Um, and they, you should not poach on almost every shot. I mean, you, once you get good at poaching, then you have to also be good at faking and staying because if you, if you poach, people are going to start to go down your line. And if you fake and stay, then the ball is going to come right to you. So um, doing anything in doubles the same way over and over again, it's not good. So anything you do all the time, is not good. You got to mix it up. Otherwise your opponents will, get on to you and get the upper hand always got to mix it up in those got it Gigi. so i just want to i know you have to feed your kids now so i'm just going to tell yeah. people to check out ggfernandez.com 
slash on court off court um, to check out uh, everything that you have your program and uh, and everything. And uh, also, if you haven't signed up up yet for uh, tennis summit, go to tennisfallsummit.com slash gg and to get those uh, you know all these amazing videos for free. And if you want to upgrade and have lifetime access to everything plus the bonuses. GG uh tennisfiles.com tennisfilesummit.com slash gg upgrade. And uh the 10 steps to a perfect volley program is amazing. I hope you all have downloaded the free ebook that GG uh so graciously gave us. Uh amazing stuff. I really love it. And uh GG, uh, what can I say? Thanks a lot for uh you know being a legendary player and also uh you know coaching everybody Thank you. spreading your knowledge. So I really appreciate it, and yeah. I'm sure we all thank do. You. Yeah, a lot of great thanks content. for having me and thank you for all the great stuff that you do with the tennis summit. And uh it's such a great resource for people now in this times when we're all kind of home looking for things to do. So it's been a great, great to watch all, all the other instructors. So thank you for doing that. Thanks, Gigi. Have a great day, you and the family, right, and uh, I hope you eat well. Take care. Bye. <laughs> See ya. See ya, everybody.